Grin Clan Gwinzi Shilaknai. Good day, all of my relations. My name is Dana Tija Tram. I am the chief of the Wantukwichin First Nation, a modern treaty holding self governing peoples, a nation of ancient heritage stretching back millennia on our traditional territories, our homelands. Our community has endeavored on a bold project, one of the largest solar panel projects in the Arctic Circle. A small village of 250 people, 80 miles north of the Arctic Circle in the Yukon within Canada, 60 miles east of the Alaska border, have created a solar panel array, over 2,100 bifacial panels, tied to a microgrid system, now satisfying one quarter of my community's energy needs. Since the 70s of diesel generation, we can now enjoy silence and hear our animals, the crows caw from across our village for the first time in 50 years. Moreover, this project is the tip of an iceberg, one in which is supported by the regulatory frameworks we have now changed with disruptive business models. Our government has now created the template of documents through negotiations with our utility, a local utility, to create the first electricity purchase agreement and independent power producing frameworks of their kind. Our electricity purchase agreement now diverts over $410,000 a year back into our community. Whereas this money would be exported to shareholders of a utility, we now sell them savings. The independent power producing document also allows us the foundation in which to erect this monolith, one that casts a shadow across the world. As per capita, we have already made incredible headway. These monies will now be funneled into a feedback loop, feeding other renewable energy projects, as our community has given us the direction to reach carbon neutrality by 2030. Per capita, no other region has endeavored on such a bold strategy. This encapsulates the Paris Accord, the hopes and the dreams of our people, a people as well across the world who are now beginning to understand the existential threat that climate change brings us. One thing that we can share as a people is the power of community and the importance of empowering community members. We as individuals across the world cannot give our power simply to international negotiators at any cost. We cannot give our power to CEOs or leaders. We as individuals need to find our identity, reach and create our communities as every neighborhood, every household should be holding their own cop. The existential crisis that climate change faces us all as a species is one of identity. Our environments are now mirroring the imbalanced psyche that we approached the environment with. Indigenous peoples across the world have ancient principles of harmonizing with their environments of creating a coexistence. You can go across our traditional territories and you would be hard pressed to find evidence of our people when we once moved through these lands in the hundreds of thousands strong, empowering our environments. If my small community can make such leaps and bounds, any community can do this. Through self-governance, we have been afforded the staunch democratic mechanisms in which to discern through the ether and ambiguity of these solutions a reality. A reality that we are now sharing across the country of Canada and with the world. The land and the animals cannot speak English, but for the people that can, the Gwich'in, listen to our words as our words are vessels for these principles one of which we need to return to, but we also show 
that these ancient principles can drive the tools of our modern society. It is not too late to return to our communities and empower them. It is not too late to create bold and ambitious projects that move us forward, but we must do so together. This is the message of our lands, our animals, and our people. Welcome to SAMSU. Um, I'd like to introduce to you the SAMSU Energy Academy. My name is Søren Hermansen and I'm the manager of the Energy Academy and I've been the leader of the transition from fossil fuels to renewable energy. That was a project that was initiated by the Minister of the Environment uh, back in the old days and uh, we became the Danish Energy Island and we had to prove in the project that we could convert from fossil fuels to 100% self-sufficient Renewable energy, difficult word to say, but let's uh, have a look inside and see what it's all about. So inside this building, we have all these meetings. We call it a community energy house or energy community house, uh, which is kind of a meeting place for energy transition, for breakout meetings, for practical trade and business meetings, for community to meet about unknown issues that we have to discuss before we can make conclusions and decisions about where to go with it. So information, capacity building, and organization structures are met here. So when we then meet at the academy, we have kind of a big meeting room where we can be up to 100 people or more. And we'll sit here and talk about what we don't know. Very often we ask questions before we get the answers. The problem for local communities is that we get the answers before we have I even thought about the questions and that is kind of giving us insecurity and la lack of ownership and lack of engagement in the local community so therefore it's really important that we raise questions how do we engage young people in the, in the transition how do we achieve, attract uh, new people to live here how do we kind of improve the local economy so we, we can make our own decisions and all these questions are raised here and asked before we then go over to the action side and start implementing wind turbines and district heating and heat pumps and energy efficiency and smart energy systems, electric vehicles and all these sort of things. These are all in the toolbox when we start the transition. So so here we have the island. This is Samsø in a little carp, carp, uh, carbon version and, and this little community undertook this, uh, this challenge. There's 3,800 people living here. We invested more than 70 million dollars worth of energy infrastructure investment, which is a lot of money for a low income area. But this was bank financed and led kind of to a circular economy thinking where we stopped importing fuel from outside and started producing our own energy, which is then kind of the transition. Today, we are facing the new challenge. We want to be 100% fossil free. Fossil free, I mean, we are not getting rid of old people, but of, of getting rid of fossils. So, so fossil energy supplies has to stop now. So we can save the climate and whatever is left of, of, of opportunities and chances here. So the fossil free society is looking at farm and emissions from farming. It's looking at transportation emission from transportation and it's behavioral attitudes from, from society in general. So the fossil free community is going to take place before 2030 in Samsø, which is very ambitious. But we think we have done it before and we also think we can do it again. And hopefully we can also be an inspiration to other communities in the world and we can be inspired by actions that is taking place everywhere where we look at similar small communities. Good luck with that. Hi everyone, my name is Ambika Opal. I'm the manager of global programs at the Waterloo Institute for Sustainable Energy, a research institute at the University of Waterloo in Canada. I'm speaking to you today from Igloolik Nunavut, which is Inuit land. Inuit Nunangani Iliksinut Okaktunga. At our institute, we run a program called Affordable Energy for Humanity, where we support communities and organizations all around the world in developing clean and affordable energy solutions. We really strongly believe in the power of energy to transform and connect to many different aspects of life, including health, access to water, climate action, education, self-determination, and more. 
Over the last year, we've been supporting Indigenous Clean Energy's Three Island Energy Initiative through a research study to learn from microgrid practitioners and community members about their experiences working with microgrids in Indigenous, island coastal, and unelectrified communities. We asked study participants many questions, including what challenges they encountered and success factors they see as important for community microgrid projects, and also what tips they had for communities looking to start a new microgrid project. Here's a brief summary of what we learned. On relationship building, almost all respondents noted that community members come first. Building trust, obtaining support and buy-in, and two-eyed seeing, or using multiple knowledge systems, are critical to long-term success. Local government authorities and agencies were also noted as key in the relationship building process. Here are a few challenges that study respondents noted. Microgrid components can often be prohibitively expensive for many communities, particularly smaller ones. Capacity for long-term operations and maintenance is also often limited. Information and data, such as spatial data, demand forecasting, and socioeconomic data remains limited for remote communities, which makes feasibility assessments difficult. Shipping, taxes, and duties are complicated and expensive, and local policies and permitting procedures are also often time and knowledge intensive. Critical success factors that participants noted included identifying local community energy champions who can mobilize enthusiasm and knowledge within the community, the involvement and empowerment of women, and financial buy-in from community members, even if it's just a token amount. Here are three general tips identified by our study respondents for communities looking to start a new microgrid project. First is focus most on the operational model and ensure local job creation is a component. Second, when making grant applications, try and involve other factors beyond energy, such as clean water, health, and housing into your application to make it even stronger. And third, go beyond focus groups for community involvement and think of other ways, such as land-based activities that connect energy with traditions and culture. This was a really quick overview of the research that we've done. For more information about the results of the study, please connect with Indigenous Clean Energy or myself. My email address is here on the slide. I'd like to end on a call to action. This research has made it clear that there are many communities around the world who already use microgrids as a solution for clean, affordable, and reliable energy access. But there are many challenges that hinder the scalability of this solution. If we have researchers listening today, there are information needs that could be met with your support, such as demand forecasting and spatial data analysis for remote areas. Educational institutions, there's a great need to support local renewable energy capacity for communities. Policymakers, reducing bureaucratic barriers and supporting communities through approval processes could greatly help. And if we have community representatives listening today, I encourage you to consider microgrids as a solution for your community's energy needs. And if this is a path that you've already started on, to persevere. From this study, we've heard a lot about the challenges, but we've also heard a lot of positive stories from communities. And I hope with you that these stories will only continue to grow. Thank you.